Happy uh, Palm Sunday, by the way. Feels remiss if I didn't say it, and I didn't say it the last service, so I'm already guilty. First Corinthians, if, if you've been with us, you've hopefully gathered that the Corinthians are not, you know, grade A examples of what to do. So much of what we've studied has been by way of rebuke or correction or that they needed to shift something they were doing. And our text this morning is no different. So we're going to look at their abuse, particularly of the communion table and the times they would gather around that. And let me just preface by saying this. As I was going through this passage, it was on my heart that we would actually partake in communion together. I mean, why wouldn't you do it? You're going to study it. You might as well. Um, but also, to, to take serious verse, uh, I think, 29 and 31, or 28 and 31, where Paul calls for an, an examination uh, of our hearts and to take time to do that after the message and then step into communion together. So forgive me uh, for those of you who are unbelievably scholarly because there is so much here that can be dived into that I'm not going to. I did, and so if you want to talk about it, we can talk afterwards. But for our purpose and trying to go through what we want to do this morning, I want to extract essentially what I think is the main principle behind him going over this at all. So, so much of the confusion around communion and so much of the fear around it or the doctrine around it has come because throughout church history, people have extracted verses 23 down to 32 out of the context and then spent eons of time focusing on just those few verses. And thus, the confusion arises. I would like to take it in the entire context and give us a principle from that context and then step into it together. So, the first thing that really struck me uh, when I came to this text was that there's always the possibility that a Christian gathering can do more harm than good. You got to see that in the Corinthian letter. And if you don't see it yet, you're going to see it when we get into chapter 12 and he talks about spiritual gifts and the mess that that was. There's always a potential that when Christians get together, it can cause more harm than it can good. The blessings and the benefits of what we have are not just givens. You don't just show up, act a fool, and then God's like, well, I'll bless it because you did it. There's a quality and a content in which you have to approach it, and he's going to address that with them concerning communion. He just addressed it with them concerning head coverings, and he's going to do the same thing here. And in case you thought I made that up to be uh, shock value. Look at verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. There you go. I didn't make it up. I just rephrased it. <laughs> he straight up tells them, when you guys get together, more bad things are happening than good things. Let's find out why. Verse 18. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. The idea is I believe a report that I've been given. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. The word divisions and the word differences, they're connected and they play off of one another. He says there's divisions among you, which means there's schisms. There are separations and splits within the community. That comes because of the verse 19 differences, which the root of that word is actually heresy. So the idea is people are bringing in party affiliations, other teachings, things that they hold on to, and they're making those issues that would separate them out from other people who disagree with those things. And he says there's divisions because there are these differences. Now the difficulty is, he says, those differences have to exist so that we can figure out who's approved by God and who's not. So who is the one who's approved by God? The one that can take those differences and lay them aside when they come into the assembly. And the ones who can't are the ones that God does not approve of. And so he goes on. So then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? 
Or do you despise the church of God? And how would they say they despise the church of God? By humiliating those who have nothing. That's a strong statement. So by not sharing the resource of what you have with those who have not, you humiliate God. So he says, shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. And the interesting thing that I thought was, there's no trophies for participation in the Christian life. They're doing the thing. You realize that. They're getting together. They're taking communion. And he says, am I supposed to be happy that you're doing that? And we would think you'd be like, well, yes. And he goes, well, I'm not. (laughs) Because the quality and the content in which you do it are wrong. So I'm not going to praise you even that. Even though you're doing the thing, I'm not going to praise you for it because it's not being done properly. So what I want to do is essentially give you the headings in my notes in order to stay on time so we can do this together in practice. The harm in the Corinthian church is this, that they're coming together as a divided group, yet they're practicing things that profess unity. That's what he tells them in that first section. Now, when he says they're coming together, you might get the idea of what you're experiencing right here and right now. That wasn't what he's talking about. So you read Acts chapter 2, and he says daily they were in homes, continuing in the apostles' doctrine, breaking bread, fellowship, praying. So what he's literally talking about is what some church historians call like love feasts. So that they're getting together on a daily basis in people's homes, particularly they're getting together in the wealthy people's homes that are Christian because they have the resource and the space. And they're gathering there to remember Jesus, to share a meal, to continue in the doctrine that the apostles are passing down. And when he says, when you get together, it's for, it's usually causing more harm, that's the context he's thinking about. So it's not like when you come into the church building and this guy gives a message and you all like go out to breakfast. He's saying, no, when you're all there in someone's home, sharing a meal and talking about Jesus and the things that we're teaching you, harm is being done. Now, how is that even possible? Well, because the rich are the ones that are hosting it and have the resources, there's all kinds of opinions about what this means. Two of them are pretty prominent. Number one is right there in the text. They're eating all the food before the poor people show up. That's pretty simple, right? You have private suppers in verse 21. So before the poor people get there, all the rich people have already eaten everything. And not only that, they're also drunk. (laughs) Not very helpful. There's another option uh, which archaeologists have shown that wealthy people's homes back then were built in such a way that certain rooms can only contain a certain amount of people. And if you remember in the early church in the book of Acts, I mean thousands of people are being converted and coming to saving faith. So if you have a room that can fit 30, you're going to have to put a few somewhere else, which is not a bad thing. However, it's possible that the rich people with the resources ate in the better space with better resource and they put the poor people in a sort of an annex with whatever was left over. And he's saying, you're causing a lot more harm than you are good because those people without resource, they're totally stumbled. Now they're coming into uh, this particular love feast and they're like, why are, why are we over here and you're over there? Especially because it seems to be that based on chapter 7, there may have been a famine at this time. And so poor people, they don't have food because there's possibly a famine. Rich people have food because they are rich. So if a poor person in the Christian community goes to a love feast or a a communal gathering, that might be the only meal they get because they can't get it anywhere else. And so they're banking on the generosity of the more wealthy Christians And when they show up, the wealthy people have eaten all the resource in the midst of a famine. And he's like, you're causing way more harm than you are good. (laughs) So that's the harm. They're saying they're unified, because then we're going to get to it now. They're going to come to the Lord's table and take communion, which ultimately communicates all ground is equal at the cross. But yet they're creating schisms based upon class or based upon any kind of ancillary demographic you want to come up with. So that's the problem, the harm that's going there. So what about the sin? The sin of the Corinthian church is they're practicing communion 
in a way that did not match the profession of communion. So look at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, as I stated in the beginning, we could sit here for the next 60 minutes and try to figure out what that means. Keeping it inside the context of what Paul's writing about, which is the ostracizing of one group over the other. He's essentially telling them the way in which you're doing this is unworthy. Not that you have to be worthy to do it. So a lot of confusion has come up with, it's like, well, if you are not worthy and you take communion, God's going to kill you. We'll get there. Don't worry. I'm going to read those verses. But that's not what he's talking about. It's not saying that you have to have such deep introspection to figure out, can I actually do this? And is my hand folded on the right when I get the... It's not any of that. He's just simply telling them the remembrance of what this liturgy does is it should bring back to your mind the sacrificial nature of Jesus who gave up what he had for you. And yet you won't give up what you have for those who have need that are right there next to you. And in that way, you are taking the cup and the bread in an unworthy manner. When he says you'll be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood, he's not saying there's a particular sin that you have to watch out for. He's saying, why was Jesus crucified in the first place? Because the people that did it completely missed the point. He was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. And they missed it, so they killed him. And if you come to the communion table without realizing what you're remembering and how that has to be expressed in your community, well, then you are also missing the point. That's what he's talking about. Because in verse 26, there's a profession that comes along with doing communion. We don't just do it to check off a box. We're making a statement by keeping this bread in this cup. And so you could put it this way. The profession did not match the practice. That's the sin. The manner in which they gathered didn't match the motives of their heart when they showed up. And in that way, he says, you guys are guilty. Because there has to be a matching of, prof of practice and profession, of manner and motive. Those two things have to be joined together. And if they aren't, you're a hypocrite. And in that way is what he's telling them they're guilty of particularly. Now, what is the judgment for that? Correction through discipline. Look at verse 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Also, much debate around this group of verses. Very simply, I think he's just making this case, and I've, I've done a lot of reading to come down with this uh, view. Number one, verse 29, discerning the body of Christ traditionally has been uh, translated as they didn't discern the bread as the literal body of Jesus. That is not what that verse means. It is just as valid and if not more linguistically viable 
to use that phrase to mean the church. Chapter 10, verse 17, we are one loaf, meaning the church. So when he says you haven't discerned the body, he's saying you haven't distinguished the other people in the room with you. That matches with verse 31, because you also don't distinguish yourself. Those two words are the same. Discern the body, uh, discerning with regard to ourselves. They're the same word, which means distinction. Not some deep perception of something that's hard to understand, but that I consider myself and the people around me different than the way I view myself and the people around me out in the public square. That's what he's after. Sure, maybe you're more wealthy than so-and-so out there. Yes, maybe you occupy, occupy a certain job or political status or affiliation out in the public square. He does not condemn that at all. But he says, when you come into the gathering of other Christians, those descriptions of you are checked at the door. Because when you walk in here, you're walking in here not because you're rich, not because you're Republican, not because you're Democrat, not because you have some sort of uh, status in your workplace. You're coming in here because you're acknowledging I'm a sinner that needs to be saved by grace and Jesus is my pathway into fellowship with God the Father. Amen. That's true for anybody under any class system, under any socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter. And he's saying you're coming into your homes keeping those distinctions, which might be appropriate there, but they're inappropriate here. And in that way, he says, you don't distinguish the body of Christ, the other believers, and you don't distinguish yourself the way that you should when you're around them. And so, he says, what has happened is that you have been judged by the way of corrective discipline. So another confusing point is that some people think, well, if unbelievers take communion, God will kill them. I hate to break it to you, but in the history of the universe, I'm willing to bet there's a lot of unbelievers that have taken communion that are out there making six figures having just a fine Sunday afternoon. You can't prove that. Some of you may have been that in your heyday, rolling up into Catholic service at some certain holiday because you're drunk trying to get warm, taking communion just to be there. You were not Christian, and you're here now. So it can't be that if you do it in such a way as that, God's going to kill you. The key to being able to understand what Paul's talking about is verse 32. When we're judged in this way, we are being disciplined. Who's the letter written to? It's written to Christians. It's not written to unbelievers. And he's saying, if you take in an unworthy manner, not if you are unworthy, you are. There you go, I said it. Me too. If you take in a manner that doesn't match the motive, if you take it in a way that professes unity while your practice actually creates division, well then, as a loving father, God is going to discipline you. It's not judgment as in there's this finality to it where it's like, well, you messed up the sacrament, so he's sending you to hell. People have taught that. And that's heresy. He literally is saying, because you're a child, so number one, he's not questioning their salvation. Very interesting, because they're a mess. <laughs> Gives me a lot of hope, comfort. <laughs> number two, he's saying, this isn't punishment. It's correction. God chastens because God cares. God disciplines the children whom he loves. I mean, go read Hebrews chapter 12. That literally says, he loves and disciplines those who are his. And if you are not under the corrective disciplining hand of the Lord, Hebrews 12 asserts, well, you might be illegitimate. If you don't feel that conviction and God doesn't work things in your life, there might be a bigger issue than you think. And so often difficult things come in life and we start blaming every other direction. Well, it's this circumstance. Well, it's Satan. Well, it's that. Well, stop with that. In this circumstance, who was it? It was a loving father. It was God. Every force in the universe isn't after you all the time, but God is. 
And he says, if you're going to be gathering together and professing something that doesn't have a practice to match it, well, God's going to discipline you. Me and my wife are privileged enough to have a son. If he messes things up or disobeys or doesn't represent us in the right way, I don't then kick him out of the house. He's five. <laughs> there's correction that comes. There's teaching. There's, sure, there's consequences. But it's not because I'm like, I'm so over it. I just need you to get out of here. It's because I'm going to mold, mold you and form you to represent what you should represent. You're my son. I'm going to teach you that. And when we come into the assembly doing it in the wrong way, that's what God does. He comes to us and says, I'm going to mold you. I'm going to teach you. And sometimes, in their instance, people got sick. People died. And what that tells me is that God does not view the body and blood of his son as a trivial thing. He doesn't view it as a check mark. He doesn't even just view it as a sacrament. He views it as a representation of his heart towards humanity. And if we are not going to represent that well, he will discipline us until we do. So that's why Paul tells them, you should think about this first. <laughs> not to see if you're worthy to do it, but to just see if you are actually portraying what the table represents. So what, so what do they do? The solution is simple. They just have to wait and welcome every part of the body. Seems kind of elementary, but that's all they were really missing. We're so foolish as people. We get into things and we make it so complex that we start arguing over weird details when the point is, verse 33, so, my brothers and sisters, when you get together and gather to eat, you should eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment or that corrective discipline that he talked about a couple of verses earlier. And when I come, I'll give you further instructions. It's very simple. He says, those of you that have resource, just wait for the ones that don't. And when they show up, share the meal. For all of the difficulty surrounding this text over centuries of church history, Paul's just trying to say, can you please consider one another? I don't hear that very often when you hear people teaching communion. And that's the whole point. Is he's like, you just need to make sure that you're not hoarding everything but that you are openly able to share with those who have need because that properly represents the communion table. So here's the lesson. We can do the right things the wrong way. It's very easy to do, to think, well, this is the right thing. And guess what? It might be the right thing. What's the right thing? Gathering together. They were totally supposed to do that. They were not supposed to neglect being together. That's the right thing. What's the wrong way? They did it holding on to all their party divisions, whatever that meant for them, and then sectioning people off based on those secondary distinctions. That's the wrong way to do it. The right thing to do is to take communion. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you're together, do this. That was the right thing to do. The wrong way was doing it by forgetting Jesus. They clearly didn't remember him. They just thought, well, we're supposed to, how are you supposed to remember Jesus when you're sitting there drunk? Answer me that. They're forgetting, but they're, we got to do it. We, and so often, that is what the Christian life gets minimized to. Well, I don't want to get in trouble, so I got to do blank. Well, wait a minute. Sure, it's the right thing, but it's the wrong way, and God is not pleased with the right thing the wrong way. That's not what he wants. That's why they're under discipline. And so as I worship, uh, as I welcome, <laughs> I'll worship too. I'll do that later. As I welcome the uh, worship team back up, uh, I want to leave you with this. Just a couple thoughts. What he expects them to do is remember Jesus and distinguish the body of Christ as something different from the other relationships in their life. That's the point of the the text. Is he saying, remember Jesus and the sacrifice he made and distinguish the relationships that you have with those who are around you inside the church as different from the relationships that you have with those who are outside the church. Don't bring in 
your secondary distinctions and then create those distinctions alongside people who are all there for the same reason, which is to meet with Jesus and be forgiven of their sin. They're not there because they're rich. They're not there because they're poor. They're not there because they're part of this party or because they're part of that party. They're not there because of some class they belong to or some class they don't belong to. They're there for Jesus, and so are you. That's his whole point. He's like, and if you come to the communion table, you're professing that. We proclaim Christ's death until he comes when we take this bread and this cup. We proclaim that that is the reason we're here. And if we're here for any other reason, it's going to come out through divisiveness. And he's trying to correct that in them. And so he tells them in verse 28 and verse 31, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. He's calling for some sort of preparation before we come to the communion table. Preparation is always the groundwork for reception. We are receiving something when we come to the table. We are not getting it because we've attained to it. We're not getting it because of the numbers in our bank account. We're not getting it because of the numbers that are not in our bank account. We are receiving something given to us by God through Christ. And if we look at it as anything else, he says, examine yourself first before you do this. Think about it. Think about it. The question that I have for our church is when we get together in any way, shape, form, or fashion, what is the quality and the content of our expression of Christ's body in this city? And I'm not just talking about right here. Certainly this is part of it. But I'm talking about when we go out for a meal with some friends. Could somebody from our church, if they walked into that restaurant, walk up to you and pull up a chair and be welcome? Or would you be like, oh, they're coming. Stop talking. You know what I'm talking about. When you're in a fellowship group, what do you talk about? Are you fostering unity even if the fellowship group is different from another one or different from sort of other parts of the church? Or are you just sowing division because the distinctions that you have, which aren't bad, are the main thing for you. And it comes out in your rhetoric and it comes out in the way that you talk about others and it comes out in the fact that you have a closed group. What is the quality and the content every time we get together anywhere in the city or here even in this room. Do we betray our Savior with our behavior? Christ gave up a lot to come here for us. And when we get together, we should be giving up a lot to be with one another. Does our behavior when we gather together in any way, shape, or form communicate unity even though we are an expression of diversity? Everybody wants to have a diverse church, a multi-generational church, a multi-ethnic church, and so do we. But we don't want that on the premise of so then each party of that begins to just stay with themselves, but we all come together to say that we've met some standard. We want to have that so all of those things intersect at the foot of the cross. That age isn't there, socioeconomic status isn't there, differences that might polarize us elsewhere, they're not there, because the only thing that's there at the foot of that cross are people who acknowledge their sin and they are in need of a savior and that makes the ground equal. Is that what we express every time we're together? And so while we sing this song, I would encourage you to go before the Lord and ask him those, this simple question. Am I selfish or am I selfless? When I come into any kind of gathering, am I there because I'm about to just corner the market on all the resources and push everybody else out? Or am I there to give of what I've been given and receive the same in return?
And that's all Paul wants. He doesn't want deep introspection to figure out if I'm a worthy person, if I'm gonna get in trouble. He just wants you to sit there and go before Jesus and say, there's a quality and a content to this table that represents something you did in time and space. If I'm gonna take that, am I doing that with the people around me? And let him speak to your heart while we sing. You can stand, you can lift your hands, you can kneel, you can come to the altar, you can stay in your seat, whatever you gotta do, whatever it is, go before him and let's examine our hearts in relation to one another and then we'll move through a couple other things together. Let's sing.